Welcome everyone to episode 12 of the Phoenix Report. I'm Jack Connor. This is going to be yet another unique episode in that my guest is not really a musician himself, but he is still a very huge part of the local music scene as a promoter. Now for those of you who may be curious as to what a promoter does, unless a particular club or venue books all their live music in-house, usually they will hire a third-party promoter to act as a booking agent or liaison between the staff and the talent. You know, they're usually the ones to book a series of bands together for a particular show, organize set times, handle payoffs, as well as contribute to the actual promotion of the show. Now, having been in and out of bands for the better part of the last decade, I can tell you that I have run into a lot of these third-party promoters over the years. Some of them I've had good experiences with, others not so much, but, uh, but I am proud to say that my guest today is not only one of the good ones, but one of the best ones I've ever dealt with. I first met James Cripps in April of 2013, which was ironically around the time when I met the guys with whom I would eventually form Vertebraker. At the time, he was booking a small Florida tour for a goth metal band from Chile called The Fallacy. James had booked the band in a small acoustic show at a place called the Sleeping Moon Cafe, which was a small coffee lounge in Winter Park, which is just outside of Orlando near Full Sail University. He was looking for a band or acoustic act to open, and I decided to throw my name into the hat. Now, the thing you have to keep in mind about this was that I was not even in a band at the time. My plan was to go up on stage on my own, just me and an acoustic guitar, and play some original songs from bands that I had been in up to that point. It was definitely a strange experience for me to go solo like that, but it seemed to work well enough, and I ended up striking up a friendship with James that extended into him becoming one of Vertebraker's earliest and most ardent supporters. And he was also the host of his own internet radio show called Rock Gator Radio, and he was even an occasional stand-up comic. Now he's looking to expand his reach even further with the creation of Blind Anxiety Entertainment. So please welcome to the Phoenix Report, my good friend and one of the best promoters in the business, Mr. James Cripps. Wow, Jack, that was a a very impressive intro. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. I mean, you, you and I go go way back, and it's a pretty interesting story how we met. So I definitely wanted to kind of set the tone there for, uh, you know, for just how long we've known each other and and how I mean, and it's true, you've really been there for me, uh, you know, even before I had the band, and certainly been a supporter of of the band from from day one. So uh, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 all true. It's and, and you know, I can't thank you enough for that. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, yeah, we do go way back because I remember you uh, actually submitting music from Impatient Nation yes. uh, to be played on the radio show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that Sleeping Moon uh, Cafe show, uh, even though it had such a low turnout, um, I think it was one of those opportunities to uh, have something come out of it that wasn't expected. And I think that was the relationship that grew between you and I with you starting a band and all the shows we've done since then. And I got to see a different side of you. I didn't know it at the time. Uh, when you do the acoustic stuff, how great your band now uh, does those type of shows as well. So when I do book Vertebraker, it's nice to have them as a full band. But you also have another great side of the band, which more people should come out and see, is the acoustic. Absolutely. You've put us on acoustically and you, you, you always put on events that are, you know, diff, kind of different from what most local promoters are doing. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the acoustic thing. Uh, for those of you listening, um, I, I see the first acoustic show that Vertebraker played together was an event that James put on. It was called A Night of Music and Laughter. And what we did, it was us and I think Brandon and Ryan from I Woke Up Early for My Funeral. We, um, yeah, that was, um, that was almost, that, that was last January, wasn't it? The first one of those? I think it was almost a year ago, uh, this coming, uh, November. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. It was the wow. First one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was that far back. But yeah, what, what we did, like, we ended up going and playing, you had the two bands go up and then do acoustic sets, and then you had stand up comics. You know, yeah. and, and, and James, you emceed the event yourself and you did a, did a few minutes and, and it was great. And, uh, that was, uh, that was just such a fun night. And, um, see, I mean, and, and I think, you know, and, and there's also things like, uh, just recently the open house that was at the boondocks, 
you know, where it wasn't a gig necessarily. You just had a lot of bands come up, set, you know, set up their merchandise tables and kind of network with each other and network with the fans who are getting in there for free. And I, I just think, you know, you consistently have a lot of like clever little ideas like that. And I love it. Well, the, the whole idea with the open house that actually came about, um, kind of like last minute, uh, Boondocks was looking to fill a Friday night. And we were talking about possibly having all the bands come out. Um, it was not a great turnout, but for only having four days of promoting time, I, I actually thought it was a pretty good turnout. You know, we were trying to uh, get people aware that there's new ownership of Boondocks Live. And I just thought that maybe if all the bands came out, I'm not saying, the you know, the numerous amount of bands in this area would come out, but if it was a, a good portion of them coming out, everybody can meet each other where there's no music blaring in the background while bands are up on stage setting up. And it would have been an opportunity for people just to network and look at the calendar, see what's open. Maybe bands, you know, would connect and maybe put some shows together and, you know, just kind of get to know each other besides talking two minutes in between set times and, you know, at merch tables. Again, you know, with music blaring in the, you know, the background from the bands performing on stage. Oh yeah, you're absolutely right when it comes to that, and uh, you know, making it free for people to come in—that's another little incentive for people to come in and just have real conversations with people. And plus, I'm sure I'm sure Brett and the Boondocks loved it because it get you know got a few people in the bar, you know in the bar, and hopefully get a few of them drinking. So it's uh you know, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, again, thinking outside the box, it's just like. You know, stuff like that, you just don't see that from a lot of uh, local promoters. And I think that really is a testament to, to how much you care about making the scene unique in Brevard County and in Melbourne, which I think, and I think you're doing a great job of it. I appreciate that very much. And, uh, you know, when I got into promoting uh, back about three years ago, my whole thing was I wanted to bring shows you know, to the area that I wanted to see, you know, being a little superficial at first because I hate traveling to, you know, Orlando and Daytona and Tampa. You know, not that I will go on an occasional road trip, but I kind of wanted to keep my time and my effort and my money in the county in which I live in. And to bring in bands from outside different Florida cities into Melbourne, I wanted to show them that we do have a scene here and it can be built up to something uh, to where it actually can be competition for, you know, the bigger cities like Orlando and, and Tampa. So with the great fans that we have here and, and some of the great people I met, I knew back then, three years ago, that this would eventually happen with enough hard work. I, I, I definitely agreed. And I felt kind of the same, you know, kind of the same way when I moved to Melbourne about three years ago, around that same time. I, uh, you know, I knew I was looking for something. Um, I was surprised at the amount of musicians I found in the area. Some of them, you know, not so much, not all of them were necessarily in the hard rock genre or some of them might have been in, in other scenes, but I still was able to kind of get my feet wet almost right away after my last band broke up. And which of course led to me starting Vertebraker and, and that being, being what it is today. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's one of those things where I was, I was surprised that even though Melbourne is a smaller town, you know, it it definitely seems like there's a bit more of a tight knit, you know, community, I guess, within musicians or at least the musicians I've run into. Oh, I agree. I, I think there is, uh, you know, I see a lot of people posting, you know, especially on Facebook, you know, about how their scenes are dying or, you know, nobody seems to work together or, you know, it's all about, egos and stuff like that and i honestly have to say minus a couple of particular bands um i don't see that here i see a lot of brotherhood i see a lot of community i see bands taking other bands equipment off stage in between sets i see band members uh, who aren't playing uh showing up at a show and you know Ver vertebrake is a great example of that i see rod and ryan out a lot at, at different shows jared you know and uh that to me is is a big thing. That that's a statement in itself. You know, you don't have to send every band member out every weekend. We all have families. Right. We all have wives. You know, you have to kind of limit what you can do. But just having that one person from any particular band show up on any given night 
is sends the great message that you know this is a brotherhood this is a community of bands that you know want to help each other out and i don't see the jealousy like i see in other markets is basically what i'm trying to say i agree i agree and uh you know i wish i was able to you know i wish i was available the night that the open house you know was going on because you know, unfortunately, I don't necessarily make it out to as many shows in Melbourne anymore because I live over near Orlando now. Right. But, um, you know, so it's a geographic thing for me, but I do, but I am glad to have, you know, guys like Rod and Ryan and Jarrett, you know, who go out and represent like that. And, um, so, I mean, it, it's definitely something I've seen and, and something I was very impressed with when I moved to the area because living in Tampa St. Pete for as long as I had, I mean, you just, you just didn't see that, and I, and I don't, I don't really know why that was. Maybe, you know, maybe it was just the way things were structured. Maybe it was just everyone was just kind of focused on their own thing, or I I don't know. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to accuse everyone in Tampa of St. Pete for being selfish or having an ego. I mean, certainly there are people. I mean, there are people everywhere who do that. So I mean, I I don't know. You know, I, I don't know what what relationship geography plays. You know, in that sort of thing in terms of building a scene. But, you know, I, I, I knew that Melbourne was a special place when I moved there. Well, I think what I've noticed, too, here, and I get this from a lot of people um, that appreciate, you know, doing shows with me and stuff, uh, they tell me they see it, the enthusiasm I have for the show, the enthusiasm that I have for, you know, meeting new musicians, new bands, discovering new music. And maybe if the person who's organizing the show tries to create that enthusiasm and shows that it's not just a business, which it isn't for me. It's not – I don't rely on promoting or anything I have to put food on a table. It's more of a passion for music. And I think if that comes out, people kind of gravitate towards it and they want to be able to make it the best show they possibly can. And if they see the guy out there, you know – busting his tail, you know, trying to get people to come out to the show, MC it, watch the door, you know, have all the show details ready to go. So all the bands walk in and say, you know, we know what time we're going on. We know how long our set is. You know, we know where we're setting up. And I think it makes uh, the show go a lot easier. And I think people will be more relaxed at the show, especially the bands that are performing. I agree. And, and that was one of the things that really attracted, um, attracted us to working with you at the beginning because it was obvious that you were doing it just because you had a love of music. You weren't necessarily trying to make a quick buck off of, uh, off of bands who were trying to, you know, you know, who were pretty much broke themselves. I mean, I've seen so many promoters, um, and I'm not going to name any names, but I, I've seen promoters who have just absolutely destroyed local markets because of their greed and because of, just the systems they have in place or the way they do things and just they they just take advantage of young bands who are trying to make a name for themselves by just taking so much of their money and not really providing a return on their investment and they and they promise them things and say that they're going to have this amount of exposure and it never happens and i am you know and that was one of the things that you know i'm you know, I know that we noticed that about you right away, that you weren't one of those guys. And that's, and that goes such a long way. You have no idea. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, w one of the main things I try to do is I, I don't try to oversell anything. I just, you know, I just try to treat people the way I want to be tr treated. And I don't promise anything that I can't deliver. Yeah, you're honest. Right. You know, so again, if, you know, if the show does poorly, and there's only enough money to, you know, pay the bands a couple bucks just so they can get gas money back home. I won't take anything for, for the show. If the show's really, really well and there's enough money to go around for everybody, yeah, I'll, I'll take a few bucks to help with, uh, you know, the posters and the flyers and, and whatever the case may be. But it was never about, you know, taking the money, you know, at the door and walking out the door. And at the end of the night, I'm the first one gone. It was It was never about that. Right, and that that came through right away. Um, that being said, though, I know how how tough a job it must be to be the promoter and to deal with and to deal with a lot of us musicians most of the time. Because I know we're not always the most reasonable people. Um, I mean, besides being a big music fan, what 
and wanting to hear more local music, um, what would you say was like one of the main reasons for you to say, you know what, I'm going to put on shows myself and, you know, was it, you know, was there, was there a particular like event or a particular thing that drew, that drove you to, to do that? Well, when I was doing the, the radio uh, station <clears throat> and then I started doing the live radio shows, people were pushing me to get into uh, organizing shows and I was reluctant. I'll be honest with you. I mm -hmm. didn't really want to do it at first because I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, so someone put me in touch with uh, Clint Pinder over at the Haven. Yeah, uh, yeah. Everybody knows him as Maniacal Mojo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told him I had an idea for a uh, Rock Gator radio showcase. I had told him what the bands were that I wanted to put on the show. And he said, let's do it. And he kind of, I guess you could say he kind of mentored me in the beginning. You know, he, he he had the artwork set up, you know, the Facebook event, you know, and he would just say, look, you know, you got to make sure the bands promote. You got to, you know, make sure they know all the details. They know what they're getting themselves into. And, you know, just treat people the way you want to be treated. And to me, that's a given. So t after that show was over, we had about 100 people in the Haven. Uh, everybody got paid a nice amount of money at the end of the night. Clint didn't take anything. I didn't take anything. It was just all about the bands, and it was just an amazing night of bands. And unfortunately, I think there's only one one or two bands from that lineup that are actually still together. Yeah, well, um, that but, happens. Yeah, but after that, I, I kind of got a taste for it, and I started doing them in different areas. I couldn't get into Melbourne for some reason at the time, uh, so I started going outside. I, I was in Titusville at the Bismarck Lounge uh, for a couple of months. And then I went to um, Winfields and Satellite Beach. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I went to the Originals and Coco. That's right, and, yeah. Yeah, and then um, I just walked into Boondocks one day, and Sam was sitting there at the table uh, having something to eat with a couple of friends. And I went in there with a proposal, and I, I just said, hey, I'm a local promoter. Uh, look this proposal over. If you're interested in what I'm doing, give me a call. And I was actually on my way to the Originals to do one of my – uh, shows and she actually called me while I was on the road, and she goes, uh, "Yeah, let's talk." And uh, that's how I got into the local market. And ever since I've been doing shows at Boondocks, I just been happy being close to home because I feel that I'm actually doing stuff now in my neighborhood and promoting the bands that I like here, as well as you know different states and different cities in Florida, but. For the most part, I'm, I'm just I, – I wanted to build a scene here. I think it just evolved into that to where I want to start making my own mark now as it was just maybe putting my toe in the water when I did the show at the Haven. Absolutely. And, um, you know, a couple things. You know, first of all, you know, Clint is a, is a gr great promoter over at the Haven. Um, always been very nice to us. You know, it's, you know he's definitely a busy guy because he handles a majority of the shows over there. So he's right. definitely got his hands full with a lot of different bands, but you know he's, you know, but he's very cool, uh, you know, about about handling that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I I definitely, uh, you know, it's it's funny hearing about all those other venues that you were through because we kind of we kind of took that journey with you in a way. Like we we had definitely played a bunch of those shows at those different venues with you, and I remember the, the first show we did at Boondocks was well, we actually went through Sam directly, but I I, I don't. I don't remember if um, if I had told you about the Boondocks before that, but I, I do remember us talking about when you were going to talk with them, and and, and so I, I remember hearing about it as it was happening. So I, I was glad that 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 relationship was able to start, and that you're still and that you still promote shows there as well because it, it's just it's a great venue. Oh yeah, I, I like the room a lot, and uh, yeah, I do remember us talking about it because I think I actually reached out to you. And asked you if you had an in at the Boondocks and who it was for me to talk to, and I believe you told me it was Sam, and uh, that's how I, I kind of went in there. But you're right, you did you did take that journey with me because as I'm looking back at it right now, uh, we kind of started in Winfield's and went up to Originals together. That's right, and, yeah, and you know, down to Melbourne now too. So that's really cool. <laughs> it is cool, and, and I, hey, not that I'm <laughs> not that I'm going to take credit for uh, for for the relationship you had, but, but I'm I'm glad that I could at least contribute to that a little bit and uh 
and be a part of it. And obviously, like, like you said, just go on that journey with you. And it's, uh, and it's cool to see, you know, where kind of, where both of our organizations, so to speak, have, uh, you know, where they are right now. We're, we're both kind of steadily growing. Verta Breaker is. And, uh, and obviously you, you have a lot of, you know, cool stuff going on right now. But, um, but, but let, let's backtrack for a little bit. Um, okay. Obviously, uh, I mean, obviously you're a big music fan. Uh, always been passionate about it. Um, uh, you know, what are, uh, what were like some of your early favorites as a kid? Were, were you always like a fan of like hard rock and metal or, uh, you know, what, what were some of your favorites early on? Oh, uh, well, my dad was a big, uh, folk rock, uh, fan. He loved Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Okay. Uh, Don McLean, James Taylor, Jim Croce. So I remember listening to that as a kid. Nice. Um, my first concert, I went to, I was 12. Um, I actually won a contest in sixth, sixth grade. I wrote an essay on why I should be able to go to a concert because I was writing a review for it for the paper. And it was Cheap Trick and the Romantics at Madison Square Garden. Nice, nice. And, and I, I, I lied. I said on the essay I had all their albums and I was a big fan. And <laughs> I Want You to Want Me was, you know, at the time was their big hit. And that yeah. was my favorite song ever. So, oh, yeah. So I got my essay got picked and I got to go and that was it. I was hooked. First concert, the lights, the sound, the, the, the energy in the room, the stage, and uh, that was it. And then um, I was a big fan of uh, Casey Kasem's Top Ten Countdown show. Oh, nice! Uh, uh, showing my age now, and I remember watching an episode where they were talking about how Bon Scott had passed away. And that ACDC, re, you know, reformed with the new singer. Yeah. And their first single off the new Back in Black album was You Shook Me All Night Long. I immediately went to the mall, bought the 45, and I've been an ACDC hard rock fan ever since. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine in my head Casey Kasem introducing. He's like, up next on, <laughs> up next on the countdown, we have You Shook Me All Night Long by ACDC. That's pretty much how it went. They talked a little <laughs> bit about it. it was a good impression. But that's <laughs> basically what they uh, they talked about. It was like, you know, how Bon Scott had passed away and the band was going to break up. And Bon's mother was, you know, the band's got to go on. That's what Bon wanted. And they got this new singer and they, cre- you know, they created this new what ended up being probably a masterpiece, you know, over the years. Yeah, yeah and, I'd say they, did, they yeah. did pretty well with that record. <laughs> yeah, I think so. You know, they did okay. <laughs> yeah, it was all right. <laughs> And, uh, you know, but it's just, that was something that just grabbed me. And I think the funny part, too, with it was I was actually sitting there on a Saturday morning watching it with my mother. And I, my jaw was open, I guess. She must have noticed I was just mesmerized by, by the music. And she just looked at me. She goes, did you like that? And I was like, yeah. She goes, I didn't understand a word he said. And I knew. <laughs> I knew it was the right thing. You know, it right. was just. You know, it didn't get the parent <laughs> seal of approval, and, you know, we moved on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're rebelling a little bit. Exactly, you know. Here's so. the next single, Let Me Put My Love Into You. <laughs> <laughs> well, giving that dog a bone. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, so I think, uh, you know, back then, around 80, 81, it was when I really got into music. Pink Floyd, The Wall was another album that, that hit me hard, and I've been a big fan of them ever since, so. Sure. You know, and I, I've gone to, I can't even count how many concerts uh, over the years. And it's just, I guess it's just been a big part of my life uh, ever since I can remember. You know, growing up as a kid, you know, listening to the radio with my dad sure. while we were driving out to, uh, you know, the uh, eastern end of Long Island and stuff like that. So I guess it was just always in my life to some degree. I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that that's the great thing about music. I mean, you know, no matter, you know how old you are or, or which area you come from, you know, the music that you hear growing up tends to be sort of the soundtrack of your life. And certain songs can, you know, have that way of like evoking a particular emotion or a memory of be like, Oh yeah, I remember, I remember where I was when I first heard this or, or, and that's, that, that's a really cool connection. Anytime you can attach like a personal memory or a story to it. Oh, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a tons of songs out there today that you know I hear, and sometimes I'll get goosebumps. Just yeah. I'm not realizing I'm listening to the tune. And I get you know goosebumps on my arms, or I get a little chill up my spine. It's like wow, you know that just came 
that memory just came flooding back, you know, right, right. didn't even expect it, you know, so. Absolutely. I, I, have you ever, uh, have you, have you ever had the urge to pick up an instrument yourself? No. No? <laughs> no. No, not at all. Uh, never once that I ever thought I was going to be in a band or something like that. Um, uh, I, I think if I ever saw myself in the music industry back in the day when it was strong, it would definitely would have been behind the scenes, probably more of a in the office capacity, you know, working for a label or something like that. I don't. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't think I could ever. I don't think I can ever do what you guys do on a on a basis where you can do shows where there's tons of people admiring what you're doing, mm -hmm. and then it, having a night where you're just playing in front of the other bands. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, that, in, that in all fairness, coaster. in all fairness, that's been most of our nights, but uh, you know. <laughs> Hey, you gotta well, start somewhere. Well, don't don't be too humble. I, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. I remember, you know, the early beginnings. Sure. There, you know, there were some empty rooms there, but I don't think you guys played to that, especially locally anymore. So, uh, you guys have come a long way, and you know, I've been watching, you know, everything you guys have been doing. You know, a couple personnel changes and mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But you know, every time I see you guys, I forget how good you guys are. You know, and. Uh, you know, and how nice everybody is and how supportive, you know, getting back to the open house last week, you know, your band was one of the bands that actually came out and represented and represented well. Yeah. So, yeah, that you know, hats off to, you know, all the guys in your band for being the type of people you are. So, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. Appreci I appreciate that. And, I mean, it's, you know, one of those things I can't take credit for it. It was Rod and Ryan and, and Lacey. They, they, they showed up. Uh, but, I mean, I, I'm I'm definitely glad that the band had a presence there. And, um, you yeah, know, I'm definitely glad, like I said, that you've been there and seen it through from, from day one. Um, now I'm, I'm a little bit curious cause, and you and I had talked about it a little bit this, uh, you and I had talked about this privately a little bit. Um, when was it, uh, that you decided to move to, to Florida from New York, from Long Island, where you're from originally? Okay. Um, well, I have, uh, I have a little bit of a, a vision issue. Um, I'm actually considered legally blind so mm -hmm. i'm actually blind in one eye and i see 20 out of 300 or two something i forget what it was last time i went which makes uh, it all the more impressive by the way that we text each other so there you go yeah <laughs> <laughs> well you know with the, some of the things that they have now they can make the screen bigger and stuff oh, there you um go. yeah so actually what it was was um i got divorced um back back then in 2005 mm -hmm. Went through some situations with health and stuff. And in 2008, I came down here to visit my aunt who actually lives in Melbourne. She said, you know, why don't you come down, you know, get away from everything that you're going through up in New York and just see how, you know, just come down and get away. So I went down here and actually stayed a couple of weeks. And I felt that maybe with the transportation that they have around here, since I can't drive anymore, uh, with the public transportation they have, I can actually get around and, you know, live some kind of fulfilling life. Uh, this is before I met my wife, uh, Anne. So, uh, you know, I was living alone. So, you know, public transportation was, was necessary for me at the time. So, uh, so I made some changes and I, I moved down here. And I'll be honest with you, I've been down here, what, over seven years now? And, uh, I don't regret moving down here. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not a bad place to be. I mean, I can definitely relate moving down here, you know, from, from Pennsylvania, from Philly and like, you know, you going across, you know, bridges and seeing the ocean and the bay or, or wherever you might be and palm trees and sunshine. It's, it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard to leave a place like that. You know, once, once you've experienced it and once you've lived somewhere else, you, right. you kind of appreciate it. Well, that's the thing, because uh, in New York, the Vision for Blind Services was telling me, you know, you can't. I was living in upstate New York at the time, so I was kind of in a rural atmosphere. Oh yeah. And the the blind services, you know, uh, personnel were telling me, you know, you have to get out of a rural area, and I didn't want to live in the city. I didn't want to live in you know some major suburb area. Mm -hmm. So, again, you know, I came down here, and after hearing what they were telling me. And seeing how Florida was and how nice the weather was year round and and stuff, it was just you know something. It, it was hard to leave my kids behind, but at the time they were twelve and fifteen, so it wasn't too bad. 
And, um, you know, I went up there pretty regularly. I was probably up there three, four times a year, uh, first couple of years. So my kids can get adjusted to the fact that I was going to be gone. You know, I wasn't living with them at the time anyway. Right. Um, but I guess, you know, if you look back at the grand scheme of things, um, it was something that was meant to be, you know, um, I was very lonely at the time, you know, I had my own business and stuff and, you know, dealing with all the personal issues I was going through and to come down here and have that bond I've had with music, um, bring me to these community of people, musicians, uh, some of them I actually call friends now like yourself, you know, it's just, it's just been, you know, wonderful. And again, I just think, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it was probably something that was meant to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, um, I think Florida sometimes get, gets a bad reputation, you know, in terms of like having, you know, having people from all over the country come down here and, you know, you, you hear it on the news every day about, you know, you know, people who come down here and I guess are, are, are trying to like, you know, and just end up going nuts or, uh, or, or do crazy things. But, you know, you, you don't, you don't hear as much about the people who are, you know, down here and just living their lives and just, you know, just honest, hardworking people like yourself and, and just, uh, just trying to get on and, and make a better life for yourself. And, uh, and it sounds like you did that. Um, it's interesting. You, it's interesting. You mentioned the, um, the, the public transportation issue. I know, uh, I know if you were probably over in Tampa or St. Pete, um, you know, it might be a little bit tougher over there, but it seems like Melbourne, you know, being a little bit of a smaller or at least a bit more of a condensed, town i should say is a little bit more friendly towards you know you know as as far as public transportation goes well yeah i i agree and you know to be honest with you that was one of the reasons why i wanted to uh to get into boondocks because traveling up to satellite beach it's just it's very hard to get up there coco right. you know even on beach side so Boondocks is actually a bus stop right out front by the McDonald's. So if mm-hmm. worst case scenario, Ann's working late and I have a show at Boondocks, I just hop on the bus and walk across the parking lot and I'm there before the bands are setting up. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah, there you it go. It was just more for convenience <laughs> than Absolutely. anything else. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so uh, let's. So what made you? Uh, what made you decide to start Rock Gator Radio, or at least get into the idea of broadcasting? Was that I guess, you know, this is before you started promoting. Was that like, I guess your, your first like major goal to, you know, I, you mentioned wanting to work behind the scenes. Did you mean, did you immediately think of like, yeah, you know, I think I want to try broadcasting a little bit and try to be on the mic necessarily, even if you're not on stage. Um, the reason why I started rock Gator radio and I'm going to be honest and blunt. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. Corporate radio sucks. Yeah. Plain and simple. So, I had this huge music collection, and what I did was uh, I uploaded a station on Live 365 Network, Mm -hmm. and um, I just took a bunch of songs from my music library, put it in rotation, and anytime I went on a computer to you know do banking or Facebook or whatever, um, I had music to listen to that was commercial free for the most part. Um, if they did have a commercial break, it was only usually one or two commercials anyway. Mm-hmm. Or, you, can, you know, the VIP package, you can listen ad-free, whatever the case was. Um, so, you know, I just started just doing that just so I can have something to listen to because I just did not like corporate radio. And I went to a show in New York, and um, I saw a band called Desdemone. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were really, really good. And I went and bought their CD at the end of the night, introduced myself. And some just, I don't know what it was. It just, I asked them, I have a radio station. I would love to play, you know, can I upload your music onto my radio station? And they were so enthusiastic about it. Oh my God, yeah, what's the link? And, you know, do you do live radio shows? You, you know, can we go on and do an interview? And uh, I, I, I just have a station. <laughs> I just want to play right. the music. And they're like, yeah, yeah, give us the link. You know, so. I was like, wow. And then I went to another show, again, a local show in New York when I was visiting my kids. And I saw another good band, and I kind of said the same thing. And they were just as enthusiastic as the first band was. So that was kind of like, hmm. So I started researching more, and I found out from Live 365 with their parameters. They had said if any unsigned band, all you have to do is just 
have you know written consent that you're allowed to play their music because obviously they're not going to get any royalties for it. Right. So that was my niche. I just started playing. You know, I would go to a show and you know I would see you know say like Vertebraker, hey, I got a show, blah blah. Oh yeah, yeah. sure, I'll play our music. Great, that'll be great. What's the link? And that's just how basically it snowballed from there. And I didn't actually do live radio shows for a while. It was just basically a station. And then I just one day got the nerve and said, look, I'm going to go live. And people listened. <laughs> it's definitely <laughs> it was, interesting how... It was amazing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting how you managed to set up because I've never... You know, I mean, obviously, I've never done anything like that in terms of, like, internet radio. But, like, in terms of how you were able to set up your own station, which was essentially, you know, just your playlist sort of on a, on a constant loop and that you could access it, you know, kind of whenever you wanted... And just kind of be surprised, be like, oh, this is up next. And I, I think that's a really interesting way to kind of experience your own music that way, but also be surprised at the same time. Oh, yeah, because I had the, the playlist on shuffle like you would do in an iPod. Right. And then I actually, and I was actually recording like my own promos, you know, like, thank you for listening to Live 365, you know, while listening to Rock Aid Radio out of Melbourne, Florida. And, I, you know, occasionally, excuse me, I would get an email. Uh, because you had your email address on, you know, your page on the, mm -hmm. the network. And occasionally I would get an email and say, hey, you know, I really enjoy your playlist. And I heard a band and I, I think the song is called, you know, this. And then, you know, and you find out that they were actually liking an unsigned band over a national. I mean, everybody knows, like, the music I was playing, like ACDC or Dio and, you know, even more modern stuff like Saliva and whatever. Right. But it was just, you know, would somebody would come out and say, hey, um, you know, I like this Florida band you were playing or I like this Chicago band you were playing. That was that made it even more impressive that this little thing that I created in Melbourne, Florida, you know, somebody in, you know, Norway or, you know, Australia was listening or South America. Yeah. And, and they got into it. And again, just music brought people together. Right, right, like like the fallacy, for example, out of Chile. Exactly. You right. know, you managed to book them on a on a tour of like I think their first and as far as I know, their only tour in in the states, or at least around Florida. So I mean, it, it's interesting how that like segued into you know your own personal collection. It, you know, that sort of transition into a way to discover new artists and to give them a platform as well. And I think that's. I think that's incredible because I think it's so easy for a lot of guys who, even though they're big music fans, it's almost like once they get to a certain age, they they aren't really that into you know discovering new music or at least you know new music that's different from what they listened to growing up. And and you've always been very progressive in that way of like you know sort of going after new talent and and not just not just my band but with a lot of other bands as as well. And I think that's definitely something to be commended i i, I think because it doesn't seem like there's enough of that <laughs> well i appreciate it and again you know that's just jeff that's just the music fan in me you know um reaching out to to someone to say if i can play you know your band's music on my station and you know getting the feedback i mean when i first started this station i was actually playing more chicago bands than i was playing florida because a guy up in there uh, from this band called lynch Mm -hmm. Found out about my radio show, and uh, his name is Mike Burke. He's the guitarist. Okay. And, uh, you know, he said, hey, man, you got a really cool station here. Is it all right if I send some of my Chicago friends your way and you can play some of their music? And I'm like, yeah, I, you know, whatever. I didn't think too much of it. And then, you know, next couple of weeks after that co initial conversation, I was getting emails left and right, MP3s in them. You know, no, nobody plays music like this in Chicago, and I can't right. believe Florida – radio stations playing Chicago music and, you know, and, and stuff like that. And then I made a connection with the guy who was uh, promoting metal out of South America, and he was sending me all kinds of South American bands. And uh, I actually had uh, my own show on the on the station where it was, it was called Metal World because I was playing music from every country or every continent in the United States. I mean, in the world, except for the United States. Right, right. You know, so you can actually hear a band from Australia or Brazil or Norway or, you know, Britain or whatever. And it was just that caught on fire. People were just like, wow, I didn't realize how much great music there was in, you know, all these countries. And, and like, again, it just grew and grew. And all I did was 
start it because I just didn't like listening to, you know, FM radio. Right, right. I mean, there is, you know, the, I mean, you know, obviously there's only so much room at the top, but, you know, it's like one of those things you don't realize that there's so much music out there in the world um, that, you know, it's like, and it's unfortunate, but I mean, it's just kind of uh, just the nature of the beast. It's like, you know, you're not always going to get to hear everything and, and every great artist out there, but at least with stuff like independent, you know, independent podcasting and radio, you, you, you know, you do have, you know, an outlet for that. I mean, you know, whether it's, you know, digital or whatever. So it's, you know, it's definitely refreshing to know that stuff like that, you know, does work. Well, I, I agree because I'll be honest with you. I think there is more great music at the local independent level than there is on the radio. I, I think these local clubs, whether it's, you know, again, in our town, Melbourne and Orlando and all around the country, I think there are so many great bands at the local level that don't get the credit that they deserve. And for a band at the local level, having anybody in their corner, they have to treat it as an asset. If yeah. you have that one person who comes to your shows that you see that familiar face, uh, that person who comes and watches your merch table, that, that person that comes and takes the drum kit off your, off the stage after you're done or, you know, shares your link, shares your event. I mean, you, you, you can't, you can't buy that kind of, you know, affection, I guess, in a way, you know, from these people. And I, I think a lot of people don't see it that way, you yeah. know, um, and they don't maybe appreciate it as much, but to have that, connection that a fan has towards a band um i'll give you a perfect example uh christina from oblivious signal told me one time she says i would rather play in front of a small crowd in a bar where at the end of the night all those people come up to her want to buy her a drink want to shake her hand buy a cd just want to chat her up for five minutes than playing in front of a whole room of people and you don't know anybody that's in the room you don't make that connection because once you make that connection, you have a fan for life. Right, right. It's, you know, it's that that's always definitely a fine line to walk. I mean, I'm sure, you know, and and I'm sure in the case of Oblivious Signal, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I can certainly say, you know, with my band, I mean, obviously we we try to grow our audience, our audience as much as possible. We try to play bigger and bigger rooms, and obviously we. You know, we you know we we still have big dreams. We still you know have dream of dreams of like arenas and stuff. Not that I mean, you know whether we get there or not, who knows? But um, but I mean, you know, I think stuff like that, and not forgetting where we came from, and not appreciating, you know, um, you know what what it what it took to get where we are or to get where we want to be. It, it's definitely important to make that connection, whether it's you know just one person, you know, one by one. Um, right. Right. Well, I mean, not to take away from, you know, I know I know every band wants to play a packed house. I mean, I would love to organize a show and have a packed house as well, too. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but, you know, but I, I think the the point she was trying to make was that that the loyalty that you get from your fans and, you know, the way they come out to shows, the way they promote your shows, the way they buy your merchandise, the way they support these GoFundMe programs when bands are looking for help to, you know, make a new album or get a new tour van so they can achieve their dream of getting out of their local market and playing across the country and, you know, and, and stuff like that. I think that's where bands have to realize, you know, that the loyalty that they get from their fans can't be taken for granted absolutely you know? not yeah so and, and and to your point about uh about there being so many talented you know you know bands out there you know at least on the independent circuit that's why it just drives me nuts when i hear people who say that oh well it's like oh well you know rock is dead or music is, isn't as good as it used to be i'm like well you know you have to look for it you know that's and it's like you know i don't care you know it doesn't sometimes it doesn't necessarily matter how um, I, I guess what what I'm trying to say is that sometimes it doesn't matter how good you are, you know. Sometimes it's about getting that opportunity to succeed, and and not and there are a lot of really good, talented people out there who they, maybe they they maybe they work really hard or or they do all the right things, but still don't quite get those opportunities. 
that doesn't mean that they that what they do doesn't matter. And I think right. that's that's a good thing to take away from it because it's like anything else in the entertainment business. It really is a crapshoot as far as success. So you oh, might yeah. you might as well just do what you want and 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 try to make that connection one by one. And, and you know if and if you're a fan, if you're really serious about wanting to hear good new music, then sometimes you got to do a little legwork too. You got you got to seek it out. Well, yeah, I mean, and and that all just goes to going to a local show. You know, if you know if you have a, a venue in your town, you know, why don't you just you know pop in every once in a while when they're having a show? Uh, what I used to do uh, with the radio station was I would see, you know, you know how Facebook is. Everybody that's yeah. in a band, you know, plasters their band, their show posters and whatever. And what I would what I start doing was I would look at show posters and I would say, oh, Vertebraker, Breathing Theory. You know, uh, you know, vilify whatever. And let, me, let me look up these bands. Oh, wow, that one's pretty good. Oh, you know, that one maybe not so good. Oh, they're playing when? Oh, I'll, I'll probably go check them out. So I did the research, and and a lot of that went to the radio airplay, and a lot of it. Was, and the local shows are only five dollars. Yeah. You know, for the most part, I mean, it's cheaper than going to a movie. Right. Right. You know, so I mean, you you might you might hit, you know, like you said, it could be a crapshoot. You can see one crappy band after a crappy band after a crappy band, but there might be that night where there's four bands on the bill and each one is fantastic and you make that connection. And if you're a band member, you might actually want to play with that band on a gig sometime in the future. And that's all about the networking and the brotherhood and the community. Absolutely. That's it. That's interesting that you mentioned the uh, the posters and and like you know as an example of seeing a poster and then wanting to go seek that seek a particular band out. Is there a you know it? I mean, and this is sort of a general question, but is there anything in particular like that a band could 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 put on a poster that necessarily grabs your attention that that you think of? Is there, is there a particular thing? Um, is there a particular thing that like you know bands can do like that that would grab your attention before you even hear the music? When you create a band logo, make it legible so people can read it. When you're in a hardcore, deathcore, metalcore, anycore band and your lettering is lightning or it looks like it's those Christmas lights that hang off your house, it's hard to read your band name. And right. if, I can't, if I can't read your band name, I can't look you up and check out your music. So you just have a legible <laughs> logo uh, that the band you know, is identifiable. At this. Right, that's basically right. what I could say. You know, you you wanna, you know, you wanna put an image up there. That's fine. You just wanna have, you know, all the guys standing there with their arms crossed. That's all cool. But the name of the band has to be seen. Right, so right. Say, it's <laughs> you know, it, it's funny you mentioned uh, you know a lot of those bands. It, it seems like they have logos that look like Rorschach tests. You know, you can't really. <laughs> It, it, it's like, well, what does it mean to you? I'm like, just tell me what your name is. Yeah, just let exactly. me know what your band is called. Well, let me tell you, there's been a few times where uh, I've seen bands on show posters and I see those, you know, there's been promoters in the past that will put every genre on a show and, you know, you're getting rap metal with, you know, deathcore or whatever. And anytime I see that, that lightning leather, lettering, I, I kind of know I'm not really going to be too impressed with the music because it's not my style. I don't begrudge anybody listening to it, but it's just not, it's just not something for my ears. And a lot of times I, I would think that I think I spelt that right. And then when I finally discovered who the band actually was, I went, oh, man, I was way off. <laughs> That's interesting that you mentioned uh, that you mentioned particular shows that have bands that um, com- sound completely different from each other. Is, is that is that always an approach that you've taken as far as like getting consistency between the bands on a particular show? Or do you like shows where like you have bands of multiple genres or sounds do you, do you do you like things to be mixed up a little bit more or do you like a little bit more consistency um i'll be honest with you i like the consistency um i think if you put rap metal with uh like a metal core band and then you have a hard rock band and then you have you know a female fronted band that you know is kind of like pop rock or whatever i i think you have that revolving door crowd you're going to have people come in for the pop band. You're going to have people coming in for the core band. You're not going to have people 
staying throughout the night. My goal when I do a show is I want the people to get there before the first band comes on. I want them to stay till the last band is done. And I want them to say, you know what? You know, this band was good. This band was Southern hard rock, but they fit with the hard rock band. This was female fronted, but they were, you know, they fit into the hard rock genre of the night. So you have a little bit of a different taste, Mm -hmm. but it's still off the same menu. And I think to me, consistency makes the shows that much better than having everything all over the place. I, I agree. It's almost like throwing different things at the wall and seeing what sticks. Exactly. And, but I mean, yeah, I mean, to your point there, obviously consistency within that, you know, you can allow for different flavors to kind of be on there and you do have the chance of like mixing, you know, of people like, you know, like, okay, well we sound different from this other band, but there's a chance that, you know, you might have people who like both of us. So, right. it, and that's always cool to like mix things up because you don't necessarily need to have every band sound alike. But you know, at least at least have it be close enough where it's like, okay, I can I can kind of see how that how that would work. Right, I, and I think that's that's the way because again, you know, you might have a, a show where you're playing right after someone that's kind of along the same lines, but maybe a little different, say female fronted, for example, and a person sticks around for your show and they actually like your set. You just gained a new fan, and they didn't really gravitate too far away from the genre that they like. And I've I've always been that way. I mean, I remember, you know, I'm not going to call anybody out here, uh, you know, to to make fun of it, but I noticed that when I first moved into this area, I was going up to the 321 a lot, and they would have those type of shows where it would be a rock band, then uh, a rap, I I don't know what that was, but a rap metal duo Mm -hmm. that was there, and then it would be, you know, like a band like Murder Fly that's like really intense. Yeah. And then they would have like an alternative rock band closing a night out and, you know, and it was just all over the place. And I, I find myself a lot of times not really staying for those type of shows because I like the consistency, you know. Right. Um, my playlist on a radio station would have some sort of consistency, different, you know, different genres, but it was always like that rock, hard rock feel to it, you know. Yeah, I mean, we we tend to, I mean, I know just because there's, like, sheer numbers out there, we tend to, like, you know, end up being booked with, like, bands that might be sounding completely different from us. And, like, even even one of our most recent shows, I don't want to pick up, uh, yeah, and I certainly don't want to pick on anyone or single anyone out, but, like, I remember, like, our most recent show, we were just laughing because we were like, okay, we're easily the most mellow band on this bill. You know, yeah. So, so we don't know how people are going to like us, you know. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's like you know, it's like. A, but I mean, you know, most of the time, I mean, you know, most the, most people are pretty cool about stuff like that. Even people of like the really heavy bands, um, you know, a lot of them tend to dig us. You know, not every, not all of them do, but I think we we get enough of them where it's like they kind of understand what we're doing, and um, they seem to be okay with it. Yeah, I, I think that show I'm talking about just recently. I think that was build and created to be a metal show and then you your band was asked specifically to be on it because of uh your relationship with uh dare defy right Um, right. you know steven was really adamant about adding you guys to the bill and that again you know it's a different type of music but again which it always goes back to the community the brotherhood and the networking oh yeah well and and i think and I think Dare Defy, you know, their their band, um, they have a little bit more in common with us than I originally thought. Because yeah. I, I had heard some of their more recent stuff, and it was, I mean, you had some screaming vocals in there, but you also had some very, like, clean, radio-friendly sounding stuff. It reminded me of Stone Sour a lot. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that's that's right in our wheelhouse. So, it, it, I mean, that, you know, that made sense. I mean, the other bands on the bill, you know, definitely were much more in that hardcore vein and, and and that sort of thing, which, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I mean, you know, you don't always necessarily get that crossover. I mean, sometimes you do, but it, it's, you know, it, it's always a, it, it's always a gamble, but I, you know, I think we did okay with that yeah. one. Yeah. I mean, uh, I agree with the, the point you made about Dare to Fight. I actually, uh, was listening to their, uh, their new single earlier today, um, Stephen had put a post up on Facebook about it. So let me, you know, give it a listen. 
And uh, I was actually surprised. I, I thought it was going to be much heavier the way I thought his band was going to be. To hear it a little different, I was actually impressed. And it's actually a good tune. So um, I could see where, you know, those two bands could possibly play a show together. And the other bands that were on there uh, as well, I mean, musicianship-wise, um, I, I think Thought of Redemption is a great band. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I actually spoke with Jerry at the open house. We were talking about a bunch of Thought of Redemption stuff. And I, I told him, I said, you know, your band is really not for my, you know, listening pleasure, but I appreciate how great the band is. You know, he's a great guitarist yeah, and, and stuff like that. And his son's a really good drummer. Um, but, you know, it's just not what I listen to. But what I book Thought of Redemption on a show, anytime. Because right. they're just really nice guys, and you know they'll do anything to 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 support the show. And you know he came out to the you know the open house. They had a Thought of Redemption table. A couple of guys from the band were there, sure, just like yeah. Breaker and Dare to Fly. So those are the people you know I gravitate towards. You know because they know and understand what it what it's like. You know to try to build something. Absolutely, and I, I haven't really gotten the chance to interact with the uh, the Thought of Redemption guys very much, but I hear good things about them. You know, they, they, they seem like nice guys and, uh, and, you know, very talented musicians. Um, you know, and, and again, that's like, you know, and, and I kind of feel the same way about that particular style. And it's just cause I mean, I, you know, I guess I grew up on classic rock. I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a singer, <laughs> you right, know, right. I, I just, the screaming thing that just really isn't my jam, you know, I'm really not, um, it's just not something that I'm interested in and just, I, and I think a lot of, I mean, I, I think there's still a lot of people who, you know, sometimes as much, as much as people like that sort of thing, I think that does keep a lot of people out who would normally love the music, but just can't really get into that particular style of vocals. It's kind of right. like how 10 years ago, you know, 15 years ago, everyone was rapping and no one was singing. Right, and right. I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of curious if, um, if, if the if that current you know crop of bands is kind of go the way of rap rock. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, who's to say? Again, I'm not trying to single anyone out or you know say anything bad about anyone or suggest that they're not as talented or anything. It's just you know that's my personal preference. So I, yeah. I'm just curious to see how you know how far that that genre will, will go in terms of you know. I don't know. I, I think there's always going to be a lot of young, pissed off uh, young adults. So oh, yeah. as long as so as long as there's you know a bunch of kids in their you know early twenties, late teens, mid twenties, and they got something to be pissed off about, there's always going to be that kind of music. Oh yeah, and and, 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 and of course, I mean, I say this like it's a new thing. It's not. I mean, it goes as far <laughs> back as as Slayer and you know and, and the thrash movement of the eighties. You know, kind of kind of morphed into what's going on today. So. Yeah. Well, to be honest with you, uh, you know, it might shock some people. I was never really into Slayer. And the thrash movement itself, there were some good bands there. But I think in time, I think when I do pull something out of my collection that's classic, uh, I kind of gravitate more towards the, the hard rock. Yeah. You know, the, the, I, I you feel know, like, exactly the same way. Yeah. I mean, every once in a while, I'll pull out a you know a Megadeth CD and you know and feel like you know I want to hear some thrash or you know old Metallica or you know Death Angel or well, I mean that's, that's the thing, Megadeth and Metallica, even at their heaviest, they you know they were still singing. They weren't yeah. just like it wasn't just growls and screams and Cookie Monster vocals, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's yeah. just yeah that 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 was that was the deal. So and and that explains why they're where they are, and you know. So, it, and again, it's all personal preference. Those of you listening, please don't like blow up my Twitter with hate mail <laughs> about this. It's just, it's just my Neither. opinion. Well, I, I do have one question for the people that are listening and possibly singing these bands. And this is no disrespect uh, whatsoever. But I, the one question I would ask if I was in your shoes, Jack, if I was doing an interview, how do they sing and growl like that without coughing? Because if I was doing it, even when I try to imitate it, I go into a coughing fit. I, I just don't understand how they can actually maintain that for a whole 35, 40-minute set and still be able to talk 
at the end of the night and interact with their fans, it to me is amazing. So I, that, must- yeah, I mean, I I will I will absolutely give it to them. I mean, there's definitely a technique behind it. Right. I, yeah. I don't I don't know what they're doing, but you know, you'll have like you you'll have like some guys who are just able to just just growl their heads off and uh, and, and just you know have normal conversations out of it, and they and they might and they might just sound like. Like you or me, just talking. It's like, oh, hey, how you doing? Okay, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's what I'm saying. So there must be some talent or technique to be able to do that and come off the stage after 35, 40 minutes and be able to say, hey, man, you know, did you get our new CD yet? Oh, oh. I mean, I mean, there, there would have to be. I, I've heard of right. like vocal instructors like Melissa Cross and the Zen of Screaming. That that was like a, you know, that's, that's sort of like a vocal instruction thing that's been making the rounds over the last couple of years. She's like a vocal coach to like Corey Taylor and, uh, and, and you know, a lot of other people who, and Corey Taylor is a phenomenal singer. Right. You know? Right. So, and same with like the guys from kill switch engage, which I mean, I, I like that band. Yeah. They've got some growly stuff in there, but they're also really good singers. And same with like even uh soil work from Sweden, I think is an excellent band that right, like, right. I, I almost wish they would do more singing because he's so good at it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree for sure. But you know, again, you know, these these are just opinions here, folks. So, you know, again, we 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 love everybody, so it's all good. <laughs> no hate mail. <laughs> no, no. Well, I mean, it's come on, it, it's the internet; it's going to come anyway. So, yeah, what are you going to yeah. do? <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I mean, as a promoter, um, do you have any any particular tips for like uh for younger bands out there, you know, who may be listening, who are looking to get started and establish a good re- relationship with a promoter or help their career, you know, at least at the local level. Uh, do we have enough time for that? I know we, we have <laughs> as much time as you need. I mean, um, I think the best way to, to keep it short and sweet and simple, right. Instead of going through a whole list of do's and don'ts, I think the best way to describe it is treat the promoter the way you want to be treated. If you want respect, as a band to get on shows, do the work, make the connections with the promoter. Don't be afraid to go on first. Not everybody can play into 1030 slot. Um, and just show the promoter that you're willing to do whatever it takes. If you're in an up and coming band as a promoter, I like to see all the band members getting involved. I mean, unfortunately Facebook is the way, People know about shows these days, so if you don't invite people, they're not going to know about your show. Nobody takes a flyer or prints flyers anymore. So just to be involved with the show itself, or you have five people on your friends list, or if you have 5,000, invite people to the show, be involved with the show. If you create a Facebook event, keep the, uh, the Facebook event active. Um, you know, tell people how excited you are to play with the other bands, even if you don't mean it. Right. Just, you know, just, <laughs> hey, you know, we're happy to be playing with such and such, and, you know, we can't wait. You know, tell people you have a video. Tell people if they come out, the first 10 people who, you know, pay the admission, you know, get a, a chance to win a free CD, do raffles. Just do something to show the promoter that you want the show to be the best it possibly can. You cannot go to people's houses and drag them out and force them to come to your show. But at least you can make the people aware of that your band is playing and that your band is playing with other bands and just do what you have to do for the show. Show up when the promoter tells you to show up. Don't argue about your set times. Set up quickly. Break down quickly. Stick around for the whole show. If you see another band standing in front of the stage while you're playing, make sure you're front standing in front of the stage while they're playing. And I think that goes a long way. Yeah, just 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 be nice, be professional, you know. Right. And work hard. Yeah, it's it's not that hard. No, it's really not. So, uh you know, I mean, let, let's let's go to the other side of the coin though. Um as far as um uh and this this is kind of an interesting question. I'm interested to hear your take on this. Uh-oh. What? Um, how do you feel about um, some of the third-party promoters who make bands sell X amount of pre-sale tickets before, and uh, and you know they end up sort of collecting the money, and, and 
Yeah, you know, I'm sure you know the kind of thing I'm talking about, which essentially, um, you know, which they, they never say it's what it is, but it essentially amounts to like a pay for play system. And they kind of offer exposure, you know, in place of that. Um, how, how do you feel about, you know, about the, uh, the presale ticket model that, that has been, uh, sort of the norm in, in, in several clubs? Um, yeah, you know, uh, I'm curious what, what your take on that is. Well, my my take on it is, I don't I don't like it at the local level. If there's four bands playing on on a show, um, my belief is that if the bands are working to bring the people in, uh, whatever cover is being charged, um, it should be split four ways, five ways. I mean, a lot of times, ideally, if I do a local show, I would like to split the door five ways. If I do it with four bands. Mm-hmm. You know, so if, you know, $400 comes in, everybody gets 80 bucks. Um, I'm a big believer in, you know, nobody gets more than, than someone else. It's, it's for the good of the show, you know, almost like a professional sports team. Nobody does it for themselves. It's for the good of the team. It's the good for the franchise. Um, so I believe, I'm a big believer at that at the local level. Whatever you, the bands put into the show, that's the benefit you get out of it. All right, and then the venue should be able to keep um, their bar and thank the bands for bringing people out to you know to buy their drinks, what they're offering. On a national level, I don't believe in having someone buy onto a show, saying for the exposure. But I do believe in bands helping with the show to sell tickets. But I don't think they should do it for free. I think if the venue is going to have a band open a show, and I think you know where I'm leaning uh, to what happened last year uh, with one of the bigger shows you played with, Mm -hmm. having the local bands do most of the work and then have that national walk out of town with all the money and Mm -hmm. leave the the locals pretty much standing there with nothing. Uh, I don't like that. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of it. I've act, I've I've had bands sell tickets for me at shows, but it's always been something that's been put out there in a discussion. Do you want to go this route? And I give the bands the option. If they choose not to do that option, I don't look at them any less than the band that wants to do it. Um, but I believe that everybody should get paid for the amount of work that they do, whether it's a national coming in or a touring band or at a local level. I, I am I get uh, very aggravated when a touring band comes in, takes all the door, and then leaves, and they never recognize the local bands that helped bring those people out um, because those people who are touring are given a consideration because, you know, they are touring, they need to go from point A to point B, and everybody wants to help out in the music community. Because maybe one day your band is going to be on the road and you're going to want that same consideration. You mm-hmm. know, it's almost kind of like a karma thing. But I don't like when a band will come in and say, you know, thank you so much for coming out. And then they don't even say, you know, thank you, Vertebreaker. Thank you, The Merge. Thank you, you know, Funeral and whoever for, you know, bringing all your fans out to see my band play. You know, so I think. In a roundabout way, the, the pay for play is not something that's very accepted, but I think sometimes it's necessary. But I think the venue has to treat the people, especially on the local level, better than they have been treating them. Yeah, I I, mean, I, I agree. I you know we've uh, you know we've definitely kind of you know used the pay for play system, and and, and sometimes. You know, in very few exceptions, I mean, you know, it, it definitely, you know, it makes sense, you know, uh, right. but, um, but for the most part, it's just like, you know, it, it just, something just seems inherently dishonest about it because they're, they're telling bands is like, okay, well, in order to get on this show, you need to sell, you're responsible for selling, say, say 50 tickets or, or, or even like a small, on a smaller level, like 20 tickets. And, you know, you know, you'll, you'll sell them at, you know, for X amount of dollars and, but whatever you sell after that, you get to keep. And and it's like, 
And, and it's like, okay, well, what happens if we don't sell that, you know, much? I mean, it's like, you know, first of all, like you said, we can't go to people's houses and make them buy our stuff and, you know, make them come. You know, there's a chance that maybe not as many people might not want to buy in advance. Maybe they might want to buy at the door. You know, it's just, right. it's, and, but then it's like, you know, cause we, I, I remember one of my early bands, like I, I, you know, because I didn't sell like, and and it was, pl- I was playing a pretty, pretty big venue at the time, but it's like, because we didn't sell, you know, 50 tickets, we didn't get paid. Yeah, see, e- e- even, did, even though yeah. we, even though we were still bringing in quite a bit of money from what we did sell, like we, we didn't. You know, and it was at an expensive ticket price, by the way. Like we we didn't certainly didn't see any of that. So he's just, I don't know. It's just something. It, it just always rubbed me the wrong way. And it's like not that we're looking for a lot of money because, like, look, we're original bands. We're not really expected to make a lot, like to say a cover band would. But it's like, I don't, I don't know. Just like something like something that lets us know that what we do has a little bit of value. Okay, I'm going to make two two points on what you just uh, said. Okay. All right, first point is I don't agree with you have to sell 50 tickets, and then once you sell those 50 tickets, you hand me the money back, and then 51 on is yours. I think that's crap. Yeah. All right? Uh, certain circumstances, I've actually had bands sell tickets, uh, pre-sale tickets. I would tell them, look, if you sell, I don't care how many you sell. If you want to sell the tickets for me, I have a touring band coming in. They're looking for you know X amount of dollars. If you want to sell pre-sale tickets for me, I will give you a certain percentage of what you sell. So if you sell, you know, thirty five dollar tickets, and I give you three out of the five dollars, your band's going to make the ninety dollars, but you're going to hand me over the sixty, and that sixty I can use to pay the touring band. So at least you feel you're getting something out of it. It helps pay the touring band, and then I would tell people also then. Once the touring ban is paid, anything else that comes through the door will get split evenly. Every show I do, I always create a show message on Facebook with the, the band members, at least the one key band member, and I lay out all the details. So they know exactly what they're getting themselves into before the show actually happens. Okay, I don't believe in not getting paid at all. We did a show together where we sold a lot of tickets and we didn't get paid. I'm not going to say what show it was. But you know what I'm talking about. And I was very disappointed about that. Right. You know, because we all did a lot of hard work for that show. And it was just basically a handshake. Thank you so much for all your hard work and nothing. And I I think that's wrong because, like you said, you know, original band members, original bands, they don't get the respect that they deserve, you know, to get paid the money that they should be getting paid. I mean, these you know these bands work hard, but at the same time, if you're a new band and you've only played two or three shows, you can't expect to get paid if you have no fan base. Right. It, yeah. It's the I mean, bands, you know, like locally, you know, we have a couple of, of big local bands that deserve their guarantees. Lydia can't breathe. Murder fly. Mm-hmm. You know, ba- bands like that. Who was I? They deserve their money. They bring people out. They have a guaranteed audience. Yeah, they have a proven track record of right, right. of, of built-in audience. Right. So I, I believe in that system there. That you know the, the you know they have to get some kind of compensation, whether they um, you know get paid you know something or nothing, because there was a show recently. I'm not going to say who it was because I was told in confidence mm-hmm. that this band did a show. They brought no one, but one of the support brand bands brought everyone. And the venue owner said, look, I had to pay the headliner the guarantee. There was no money to give your band, and I'm sorry. That band that got paid all the money should have known that the local band brought those people out and they should have turned around and been gentlemen and said, look, you know, we realize we didn't carry our weight tonight. You know, we'd like to give you something out of the door. Uh, you know, even if it's 50 bucks. Well, it, well, it, well hey, James, it, at least they provided that local band a lot of exposure, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> it's like, come on. You, you, you know what I'm saying? So that that's the thing, that they just took the money and ran. 
and they didn't appreciate what the local band did. But at the same time, the local venue didn't compensate the local band either. And I think that's terribly wrong. And that's what I'm saying about coming in, taking all the door and leaving, and that's showing the appreciation for the band on the bill that did all the hard work and brought their people. So that local band played for their fans, their loyal fan base, but who, who got the you know residual effects of it? The headliner that didn't draw anybody. They got to play in front of an audience, right. but they took all the money. To me, that is what's wrong with the system. I agree, I be- and, and, that's, and, and that's one of those th- reasons why I'm like, I'm hesitant to take my band on the road because it's like, I mean, at least I know it's like, look, I know that we're not going to draw, you know, too much in, in this other town. That's why I'm not going there yet. It's like if, if, you know, if you need to do that, you know, to make money on the road, then maybe you should be a little bit more selective about where you tour. I don't know. Right. Well, you know, I mean, it's a, the, it's a, it's a catch 22. I know it's right. like you, you have to play to get, to get fans, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely, there's definitely an argument to both sides. Yeah. Well, the, the example I see here in Melbourne is, uh, you know, bands that have come over here and played a few times and they can actually call Melbourne, uh, you know, one of their second homes. I mean, Red Calling from Tampa has a, a great fan base here, uh, Nine Mile Drive. Absolutely. Oh, those guys tour everywhere. They're, right. they're one of the hardest working bands I know. Right. You know, Oblivious Signal's another one. They've played here, you know, a lot. Mechanism, mm-hmm. uh, Kill the Sound. You know, th- these bands have solid fan bases here. And, uh, you know, and that's just from, you know, start. I remember the first show I did in Titusville, I had Kill the Sound come out. And they played in front of like 30, 35 people, if that much. And it just, you know, every time they came out here, the, 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 the fan base, you know, got larger and larger. And it might just be a couple of people at each show that increases it. But when you approach a band like that from Orlando and say, hey, you, you know, you want to come over to Melbourne, and do, they know they're going to come over, they're going to get treated well, they're going to have fans to play in front of, and it just makes it that much easier for them to, to come out and, and expand. Absolutely. You know? So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, you pretty much hit the nail on the head right there uh, <laughs> as far as uh, – as far as how I felt about, you know, some of those, in, some of those other, um, <clears throat> promotion practices, shall we say. But, uh, right. but I mean, you, you've definitely, um, you know, you've definitely been honest with everyone you've worked with. I can, I can personally attest to that. And, um, yeah. And, and that's, that's why, that's why you are where you are right now. And speaking of where you are right now, um, let's talk about blind anxiety entertainment for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's. Uh, I mean, let's explain to the listeners uh, wh- what what this new venture is that you're involved in. All right, um, Blind Anxiety Entertainment was basically uh, it started out as just a logo uh, to put on show posters that shows that I was promoting or being a part of. I wanted a name to have on a show that when people look at a show poster and they saw Blind Anxiety Entertainment, they know that James Cripps was behind either putting the show together, organizing it, getting the bands, whatever. And I just wanted people, when they see the show poster, they can say, that's James's show. He puts on pretty good shows. He brings in really good bands. I got to make sure I, I, I stay with the Blind Anxiety Entertainment. So I have to thank Matt Carver from Staring Blind for coming up with the logo uh, and he did a great job. I kind of told him what I was looking at, and he, he nailed it right on, on the head with that one. So I had to give him a, a quick shout-out for that. Um, after after that, um, I had my buddies in Convoy, a uh, Chicago-based band, wanted me to start helping them get their name out more. They wanted to get outside the uh, Chicago market, and they just wanted to start you know, doing some tours and making some connections and and stuff like that. And they just said, look, you know, we want to work with somebody that we can trust. We want to grow with that person. We want to make mistakes with that person. And we want to reap the re- rewards with that person. So we kind of just sat down and we, over a couple phone conversations, and we kind of mapped out an idea. And uh, that's how Blind Anxiety Entertainment got started. It was just basically starting a community of people that wanted to work together 
help each other out, be like-minded to a certain degree, but also have the freedom to express themselves and express any ideas um, and just, you know, help each other out. If somebody has a connection at a venue, they bring it in, not just for their band, they bring it in for everybody else. Um, if somebody had a connection with a photographer or a videographer or, or something like that. So as that was evolving over the winter of last year, you know, over the holidays, you know, December into January, Mm -hmm. um, I had approached my friend Christina from Oblivious Signal. I had told her about this idea and kind of wanted to know if she thought it was feasible. And she was like, yeah, she was, I I think, you know, strength in numbers, you know, that says a lot. And she was on, I, I kind of like the concept of what you're doing. And she goes, I, I would like to actually help you and maybe partner up with you where I can do the marketing and the image. And because my band is signed, I can kind of offer my advice and some of the stuff I've gone through to have bands know what labels are looking for and, you know, just offer that part to it. So. We started talking about some other things, and then we actually talked about a couple other bands that we possibly wanted to work with, and it just evolved into now a community of four bands uh, that we're working with. Uh, Vertebrae, who is the new addition, yeah, I'm yeah, very happy yeah. About that, the cats, the cats out of the bag now. I know we already uh, we already addressed that, but uh, but yeah, right. it's uh, there are a few other bands on the on the roster as well. Right, uh, Convoy, uh, Demented Truth from Tampa. Um, and I woke up early for my funeral, which is, I guess, half Orlando, half Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, they're, so, they're, they're, kind, they're kind of both, you know, they're, they're yeah. really good friends of ours. Right, so, and everybody, so far, has been working really well. Um, funeral has um, expanded outside the state. Uh, they actually have a, a nice tour coming up at the end of September, uh, first week of October. Uh, Demented Truth and Convoy hit it off so well that when they when Convoy comes down to Florida... Demented Truth is their touring partner. Um, Demented Truth is actually going up to uh, Illinois and Wisconsin uh, later this month. Convoy put that whole tour together for them. And then uh, we actually made a connection in Indiana nice. uh, where they have this nice uh, venue. It's called the Fifth Quarter Lounge. And uh, Mona is uh, great. She loves Convoy. Every time they go up and play a show, we play a practical joke on the band. Oh, and no. she's all yeah, she's all about it. So uh, <laughs> we have a lot of fun. I actually had um, Convoy just played the Fifth Quarter Lounge uh, just this past weekend, and um, the promoter actually got on stage and was dancing around with fake breasts, getting him in front of uh, oh, the singer while he was playing the band, you know, playing his song, and he was kind of like walking around on stage. He's trying to throw the band off a little bit. And at the end of the video, he has a big sign. This is uh, compliments of James Cripps <laughs> and, and all the band members just started laughing. So, nice. yeah, yeah. So, you know, so everybody's having fun and, you know, it's just, everybody just wants to work together and, it, and it's, it's good, solid people, you know, and how far this goes, I, I, I don't know where it's going to go, but I've already seen some stuff in the positive light where, Bands are getting opportunities, and they're getting more shows. They're getting some paid shows now. They're being requested. Um, you know, just the band, you know, camaraderie that they have uh, when, when they're together on stage. You know, Convoy and Demented Truth. They they trade off. You know, their the singer and Convoy will sing with Demented Truth, and vice versa. You know, and, and it's just, I, I just find it's great to be working with people who want to do this, whether they're going to be, you know, just going out once a month, you know, just playing a one weekend or, you know, they take a week off and they say, you know, James, you know, can you help us make the connections to these venues and we can book the shows with them and and stuff like that. It's been great. And uh, it just, all this stuff just evolved from just having that radio station five years ago. You know, it got from the radio station into being a show promoter. I, I can't say I'm a, I'm, I'm a band manager, but it's just putting this community together to have all these bands that want to work together. And it was an idea that came about actually a few years ago with uh, my buddy Stephen Dakota Black. Yeah, he yeah, kind, I he, those guys. He, yeah, he kind of wanted to put a community together with 
uh, bands working together, touring together, you know, doing shows together, just getting the bands out there. And it never got off the ground. Uh, the bands that were kind of involved um, broke up and, you know, it just never took off. And when, you know, Convoy, especially Brian, who approached the idea to me late last year, you know, we kind of, you know, brought the idea back to, you know, a resurgence. And we just took that idea and moved forward with it. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, like touching on what you said earlier, I definitely want to stress that Blind Anxiety is not, it's not a record label. It's not really a management firm. It's like you said, it's more of an informal, um, you know, networking group, but you know, one of the, I mean, to this day, we, we haven't really like signed any kind of contract with you, but I mean, but when you explained to me what you were doing, I thought it was brilliant because even though it's on, you know, you know, e even though it's on more of the local club level, it's still getting organized and getting bands to interact with each other and to, to spread out farther in an organized sense. And, and, you know, and that's the great thing about, you know, being, you know, associated with something like blind anxiety entertainment is that it makes us like, you know, you know, vertebraker, for example, it's like, you know, it, it gets people's attention. People are like, Oh, these guys are part of something. They're part of a, a group of, or a, like a big of something bigger than just one band trying to do it on its own. Like that they, they see is like, Oh, Oh, they're with blind anxiety. Well, they must be good enough for someone else to kind of take a chance on them or at least want to put their name, want to, want to attach it with us and by the same token, you know, it, it allows us to work more closely with the other bands that are on the roster. And, and I think it's a great thing. And I think it could potentially be the start of something. You know, what, it, what it's going to be, we don't know, but I, I'm excited to see where it goes. Well, that's a great spin on it because, um, I just think, you know, that that's what it's all about. And, you know, and there is no contract. It's just, you know, anybody's free to leave at any time. Um, you know, but I, I think people understand where I'm coming from, and, you know, with the, the strength in numbers and, you know, each band has brought, you know, great ideas, you know, t to certain lights. And, you know, we're talking about getting sponsorship now from, you know, for certain things. And, uh, you know, and you said, you know, it's not a, a record label, but, you know, who knows, maybe down the road it does become something like that. Maybe. Where, you know, bands, you know, you know, there's plenty of websites out there that you can use to to actually start something like that up and get these, you know, bands touring together. And, you know, whether it's just regional or, you know, within state, it could be something. Again, you know, a lot of the bands, you know, do have full-time jobs. They have families. Yeah. You know, and, you know, going on the road, you know, I – give great credit to anybody who wants to make a life performing music, but you know, in reality, does it pay well enough to, to sustain a life? Very rare. But at the same time, if you enjoy doing what you're doing and you want to get out on that stage once a month and you, you know, you're tired of playing Orlando and you're tired of playing Tampa and Melbourne and you know, there's a, a great venue up in Georgia or Alabama that wants you guys or, you know, even in southwest Florida or something, you know, it's an opportunity to play in front of new faces and it gives you that connection with new people and you never know where it's going to take you. You never know who you're going to meet at any given time, you know. Absolutely. Right. So Absolutely. And, and, and like you said, it could be the start of something, you know, I mean, and maybe not necessarily a record label in the traditional sense because – seems like those are kind of going away more and more as time goes on, you know, just with the way technology is and the way the industry is, is now. But I mean, certainly there's always going to be a, the, the need for some kind of organization or some kind of, um, you know, some kind of representation, at, le at least for bands. It can't necessarily be the wild west all the time. So, uh, you know, m right. m maybe, you know, maybe something like blind anxiety could resent, I mean, could represent like sort of a new model in terms of like, how bands are represented or, or how they network with each other. And, you know, you never know. I mean, it, it all has to start somewhere, though. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I, I, I would like to have, a, you know, maybe some sort of uh, professional booking agent help the bands that want to be out on the road more. Um, locally, we can handle, you know, pretty much, you know, everything, you know, 
with uh, the band being all in different markets, you know, Vertebrae can help in Melbourne and, you know, Funeral in Orlando and to make the truth in Tampa and stuff like that. But, you know, it'd be nice to be, to rec- be net recognized where a booking agent says, look, you know, these bands are, you know, at a local level, but, you know, they're out touring, they're making money. We look at the Blind Anxiety page and, you know, or their website and you see all these bands are active with shows and they play out a lot and, you know, the, their likes are going up on Facebook and, you know, people buying their merchandise and, you know, that that's what it's all about is just getting the name out there. And, that, and that's basically what I'm doing. My part of it is just trying to get people aware of the bands, you know, and, and eventually, you know, we like to get more of the music on different radio shows and maybe getting more interviews done. But it's all just a slow growing process because it's just basically me running it with the promotion part myself and then trying to or- keep everything organized and then having, you know, Christina with her end of it. And then I try to have one band have a representative and we kind of create a board. Mm -hmm. So if say, I think Rod is going to be the the representative of Vertebraker. So if I talk to Rod about something that's going on with blind anxiety, he will take it to the rest of your band and bring it to you in a band meeting. The band will, vote on it or discuss it or whatever and then it'll go back to Rod instead of me contacting you and and Greg and and Ryan and so on Mm -hmm. you know I just get that one person and then if we want to bring any new bands in it all goes to a vote because everybody has to be like minded and understand what we're trying to do here we don't want bands coming in kind of grabbing our network and then running off with it you have to understand sure. I mean, it. It, it sounds as good. It sounds good as long as you don't let it go to Rod's head. I mean, you know, he's he, he could just become <laughs> drunk with power. You know, you never yeah. know. But no, nah, no, nah, he, well, he's, you know, he's, he's awesome. I saw his ballot. So I'm counting all the ballots for the the Metal Music Awards that are coming up next year, and uh, he just voted for himself in every category. Well, so that, I, I don't know. You know, he, even lead singer because you know that one time he did that. That show you couldn't come at, and now he thinks he's the lead singer of Vertebrae. Well, you know, I mean, you know how he gets. It's just. <laughs> ah, we love you, Rod. Uh, we are just kidding, but none of this is true. I mean, <laughs> at least about Rod. Um, no, he, he he's the best. Uh, but um, but yeah, I mean, I, it, it definitely sounds sounds interesting. I know. Um, <laughs> And I know that, you know, there will be a lot of people listening to this in, in the local area that will be interested in finding out more about it. I know if you hadn't already approached us, I would probably be bugging you about it. It's like, hey, man, what can we do to get on blind anxiety? So, um, so I mean, I'm sure that, you know, again, you're starting this thing up. I don't know how much you're looking to recruit at this point, but what what would you recommend for a band who – you know, who might want to get on blind anxiety or should I say, what are you looking for in a band? Um, I'm, I'm looking, well, to, to get in with blind anxiety, egos have to be checked at the door. Okay. Uh, there's, there's no egos. Everybody's here to help each other out. Um, it's all about, I, I believe I can't quote it exactly, but on the, on the Facebook page for blind anxiety, the description is basically friendship, brotherhood, community, music. I like that. You know, that's and awesome. that's and that's basically what it is because music has brought me friendship. Music has brought me community. I'm involved in the music community, uh, you know, because of my love of the music and all the bands and everything out there. Out there, and it's also created a brotherhood. You know, I go to a show. Sometimes I feel like a rock star because. You've probably seen it a few times. I, I get pulled in 30 different directions. Everybody just wants to say hello to me. Thanks for coming out to the show. Thanks for, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And that that's what I'm saying is I want to create that. I don't manage any of the bands. The bands are free to manage themselves. But I'm here to help them in any respect that they, they need to help whether everybody's working full-time jobs and they just need someone to write emails for venues to notice your band to actually put you on a show, trying to get me to contact local promoters in different markets. Um, if you're looking, hey, you know, James, we're putting a new record together. Do you know somebody who can help us, a studio? Or That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to get the band out there. We're actually working on a website where the bands will be listed on there, all their uh, 
shows will be listed on there. All the band's merchandise will be listed on there. It will be a, a giant store where all the bands will be able to sell everything that they own. There will be music up there. There will be video. And it will be just a place to go to discover music because if there is a promoter looking at Vertebraker and saying, hey, I, I like that band. I'm going to book them. But I was just checking out. I woke up early for my funeral. I like them too. I might want to book them as well. You know, So it's right. all about bringing people just – Funneling all that stuff that bands have and having it in one spot and working together. And if this grows to where it's more than four bands and it becomes a dozen bands, it's great. It just everybody has to be like minded but free to think, you know, within themselves and manage their bands the way they want to manage them. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean it doesn't get much more straightforward than that. I mean and, and that's 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 why we love working with you, man. You're straightforward. <laughs> you know? I appreciate that. I, like again, it all just goes back to, you know, what I said earlier. I just treat treat people the way I want to be treated. You know, we all know the music industry for the most part. You know, there's a lot of sharks out there. People, oh, for, yeah. for the wrong intentions. But you know what? There are people out there for the right intentions. You know, um, I learned a lot from the first radio show I ever did, the first concert I ever promoted. I'm pretty sure there's people out there that'll say, oh, James Cripps, you know, he's, you know, I don't like him or, you know, he, we did a show with him and, it, you know, the, the crowd wasn't great or you know, we didn't get what we thought we were going to get. You know, it, it's a learning process, but you, you, you have to fine tune that with experience and you can't get experience without going through all those trials and tribulations. So if there's anybody out there that, you know, think that I screwed them over, you know, a show or something like that, that's, you know, my mistake for just not knowing, you know, at the time. I can only go by the advice I was given. And even to this day, you know, I, I talk to a lot of different band members and other promoters and venue owners, and, you know, I just pick their brain when they give me five minutes of their time. I mean, you know, people are very busy. I get it. But, you know, sometimes I just value that one opinion. Well, yeah, because of that, course. You, I mean, you know, I, even, even back like we were saying earlier with, you know, you and I, you know, about boondocks, you know, have you ever played there? You know, what's the room like? Who's the person to contact? And, you know, you took five minutes out of your day to say, uh, I believe the person's name is Sam. You know, this is how you can contact them. Good luck. <laughs> you know, and that was it. You know, so that's what I'm looking for, you know, when it comes to working with people. So. Absolutely. And I mean, to, to anyone who like might have gotten on your case about, you know, about something that happened early on, I mean, it, you know, it's like being in a band. Obviously, you know, in the early days, you don't, you can't expect to know everything out of the gate. And right. sometimes there are going to be mistakes made. But I mean, again, you know, you know, when dealing with a promoter, probably even more so than the experience, I would say try to look at that person's character and and how they treat you, and and that that goes a long way. And if they're willing to, you, you know, I mean certainly a promoter's willingness to, to be flexible and to be humble and, and to, to learn new things, which you have. And that's why you've gotten, you know, even better as time goes on. It's the same thing with being in a band. You have to be willing to, to grow. Right. And I, and I agree a hundred percent because there, there have been times where, you know, it got hard and, you know, trying to get people to think in, you know, your line of thinking. And when you can't get that, then, you know, that's the people you don't want to work with. Yeah, it's well, not something, and you're it, only it, human too. Right. I mean, stuff's right. going to happen. Right. Exactly. But, you know, for all the shows I've done, I, I would say most of them, you know, were probably, you know, good to very good. And there were some fair and there were some poor ones, you know, it, it just happens on any given night. You never know. You might think you have the best lineup, and nobody shows up, and then you think you have, oh, well, I just kind of threw this show together because a couple bands wanted to play, and then everybody comes out. So you just never know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's you know? the nature of live music. I mean, it, right. it is unpredictable. Right. So, you know, so I, like I said, it's all, it's all from the heart. And Absolutely. I've had people tell me who don't even know me that well have come up to me, you know, in, in a local bar or, you know, at a show or whatever and say, Hey man, I know we haven't really worked with you too much and stuff, but you know, from the heart, we know that, you know, you, you try to do the right thing. And that's why we appreciate 
what you're doing. You, you're not in it for yourself. You're in it for the whole grand scheme of the show. Right. And, and, and it shows. And I mean, yeah, I'm definitely excited that my band is sort of the, you know, one of the first to, to be a part of Bland Anxiety Entertainment and uh, just to be a part of what you're doing. And I got to tell you, man, I think you're doing the Lord's work. You're, you're definitely doing it the right <laughs> way. And, uh, and you know, like I said, you're you're one you're one of the few honest promoters in this business. So and so I I take my hat off to you proverbially. I don't I'm not wearing a hat right now, but if I was, I would take it off. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, Jack. And again, it, it just shows why Vertebraker was one of the bands that were picked. You know, you know what I'm saying? Because you, all you guys are good guys. You've always done you know the right thing for the show, whether the show had a good turnout or a not so good turnout. You know and that's what I've always been looking for is to be around, you know, the right people. And I, I mean, I think it comes down to the same reason why you're doing it. We do it for the love of the music and we love to get out there and, and to perform the same way you love to be around the music and to, and to promote and to see it grow. So right. it's right. It's the same thing. Yeah, I just, lo- I just love the Melbourne community. I, I I'm just, it, it, it blows me away. The amount of loyalty that, these people have for the bands that they love, regardless if it's, uh, a, you know, a hard and heavy band or a punk band or whatever. And I really think that Melbourne and Palm Bay are getting noticed from other cities because I'm hearing it from other bands that come in here that, hey, say, you know, if Tampa was half as good as Melbourne, we'd have a great scene there. Oh, don't uh, I know, yeah. man? I spent a lot of time out there, so I know. Believe me. Right. You know, and I'm I'm hearing it from Orlando. I mean, no disrespect to Orlando. You know, there's some really good venues out there and stuff like that. But you know, people are telling me it's starting to get very, very clicky out there in Orlando, mm-hmm. and only certain bands get certain shows and and stuff like that. And I try to spread the wealth. You know, if you do the right thing for the show. You're going to get X for bigger and better shows if your ego uh, gets in your way and you don't do anything and you have a chip on your shoulder. You're going to find yourself a lot of times outside looking in. Yeah, and, and I mean certainly in the case of Orlando, we played there, you know, a little bit, a handful of times over the years. Obviously, Melbourne's our home base, but you know we're slowly kind of cracking our way in there. So it's just it's one of those things that just takes time and patience, you know. Blind anxiety will get you in there. No problem. Oh, oh yeah. We, uh, <laughs> we've been talking about a lot of things, and we don't have anything specific yet, but I'm sure that as 2016 rolls around, there will be uh, quite a lot of uh, new developments popping up. Oh, yeah, I think so. I think uh, Vertebrake is going to start putting some mileage on their cars. Yeah, we'll, we'll see about that. So uh, <laughs> as long as we can pay for gas, we'll be all right. That's it. That's the main thing. <laughs> Anyways, James, before we wrap it up here, um, where can uh, where can folks go to find out more about Bland Anxiety? Or, or is, if, if there's anything else you want to plug, the floor is yours, my friend. Okay, well, you know, Blind Anxiety, we just have a Facebook page right now. I said we're working on the website. Um, but, again, you can like the Blind Anxiety page uh, on Facebook. Uh, you can um, – see all the shows we're organizing as well as the bands that we are helping out because we still do the show promotions as well as helping bands out. So I guess I'm multitasking at the moment. So, uh, you know, I sponsor a lot of shows in the area um, at Shady Oaks, uh, the Landfill Saloon, and, of course, Boondocks Live. Um, coming up in September, um, we have a show in um, – Shady Oaks, it's a glam glam show too. It's all female fronted. It's a free mm. show, twenty one and over. It features Oblivious Signal, Auditory Armory, A Light Divided, and Sunshine and Bullets. Ah, and then, great lineup. Yeah, and it's a free show. So, and it's a nice venue. Um, you know, stage is a little small, but it's a nice intimate setting. It probably holds about one hundred and fifty or so people. So, it's a nice little thing that uh, Chris Sherry's got going on over there. And then Boondocks. He's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. He's doing a lot of good shows, and yeah, you is. know, him and I have been working together on a lot of stuff. It, it's interesting that you mentioned the uh, the glam. What would you call it? Uh, it's called glam. It's the glam show. Glam stands glam for show. gorgeous ladies and metal. Gotcha. You, you know, you you have I've I've always noticed about you from day one. You've always definitely had a definitely had a soft spot for the uh, for the female fronted or the bands with with females in them. 
And, and yeah. I think that's really cool because it seems like it seems like they tend to get treated a little bit differently. There's almost a little bit of sexism out there, and I I, I like to see less of that and like to see more of these more talented women, you know, get get the chance to to you know run with the boys. Well, yeah, and there are some really good bands out there, and some of them don't even want to be associated with the female front of genre. But you know, if it I think looks like a duck, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I think, uh, yeah, you're right. I do have a uh, you know a soft spot for the female fronted uh, bands. I I really do like that genre a lot. Um, but at the same time, it's just it's all about the people you work with. You know, it, yeah. it, you know, it could be a thrash band. It could be you know, uh, a hard rock band or whatever. I would love to see Melbourne create a really good female fronted hard rock band. Uh, that would be an awesome, awesome thing to see here. Yeah, I mean, we, well, I mean, we don't da- have that. Well, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, you know, Dare Defy, uh, their 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 bass player is a girl. They have a girl right. bass player, so, but right. not 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 a you know, she doesn't sing though. So, but I see what you mean, and I mean, yeah, it's it's not even. You know, I, I mean, I think if we look at it as less of even a genre, it's just, you know, they're just rock bands that happen to have women in them. And, and, and I think and I think that's a great right. thing is, you know, because it's like, I mean, anyone who doesn't want to be, you know, associated with that sort of thing is, just, I mean, that that's ridiculous. I mean, it's, you know, hard rock and, and, and metal and just music in particular is supposed to be inclusive. I think it's, you know, I, I think there should be room for everybody. Yeah, I, I I agree, and I think uh, again, it just goes about the people you work with, and you know what you're trying to do, and, and it's all about again, you know, the brotherhood, and you know, getting back to like you were saying about and, the and shout outs si- and sisterhood too, <laughs> right, right, you know, and what you're saying about the shout outs, it's you know, I I can sit here with a whole long list of names and thanking everybody personally, right, 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 but that to me it that says a lot in itself that there's so many people to thank. That sure. there are so many people out there that care about what's being done, and you know the venues, the, the the promoters, the bands that are playing the music. You know, it's just music has brought me so many friendships. You know, so much brotherhood, and to see people like yourself doing podcasts and wanting to inquire and ask about how different people do things, how they got started, and so like that to me is is amazing. And it's just, oh, thank you. It, it, yeah, I, I just, I get lost for words because it's just, I'm just, this is what I wanted it to be. And this is what I wanted to be around and to actually see it in fruition. I'm not saying I did this. I'm just saying that I'm part of something that I, when I first got into it, I was hoping it would be like this. And to see it like this, it's, it's very overwhelming. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, it's, yeah, you know, it's definitely a team effort, and, uh, and I didn't ma- mean to get you off on a tangent there. I know you had a few <laughs> other things that, that that you were going to promote uh, besides the, uh, the the glam show. And uh, what what else have you, have you got for uh, for the people to check out? Well, we have a lot of shows coming up. I'm again, you can check the events tab on the Facebook page. But some of the bigger shows we got coming up: uh, Boba Flex is playing uh, Boondocks Live on October third. Uh, Save and Able was announced; uh, they're coming back, and they're going to be playing the landfill. Yeah. On October 30th, uh, we actually have Seven Stone Riot coming back uh, on October 17th. And Verta Break is yes, we, on that we, show. Yes, we will be there. Yes, so I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, Seven Stone Riot played Boondocks uh, earlier this year, and uh, they put on a, a great show, and they're a great bunch of guys out of Alabama. So, and then we have, um, you know, like these glam shows, and uh, we have a glam show three coming up, and, you know, we're just working on all kinds of. Uh, Local shows, and I hope to maybe put a, a Blind Anxiety Entertainment show together where we can get all four roster bands on the same bill uh, sure. and have it all, to be all about Blind Anxiety that night and and stuff like that. So we're working on a lot of good things, and it's just all about the people you surround yourself with, you know. And everybody, you know, especially on Facebook, you know, says about drama in their life and and things like that. I, I have to say, I'm blessed. I don't have it, and or do I allow it? Definitely. You know, I, I keep that, the tunnel good, vision. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to be. Yeah, I just have the tunnel vision, and I just I, I deal with the people I deal with, and I'm happy to do so. And it wouldn't be anything I wouldn't do for any of the bands uh, that I work with, with Blind Anxiety or not. If my name is on the show, I, I do what I have to do for the show and for the bands on that show. 
There you go, man. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> James, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, to be on this podcast with me. I've been trying to get you on for a long time, and especially you know since we made the announcement a little while ago that that we'd be working together a little bit more with the with the new uh, the new venture. And I'm excited to see where things are going to go, and I'm sure I'll definitely have you back on at some point. I mean, we could talk for several hours. I'm glad we kept it down to only two for the sake of the <laughs> listeners. Um, hopefully, you guys are still tuning in by this point. But uh, no, it's it's all good. Um, but yeah, I mean, th- th- this has been awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it, Jack, uh, for the opportunity. And uh, maybe uh, down the road, maybe you might want to break it up as a part one or a part two interview. <laughs> maybe, maybe that, that that's the beauty. Because people were complaining about some of the longer podcasts. I'm like, you know, it's on demand. You know, audio. You can just go and listen to some of it. You don't. It doesn't have to be all in one sitting. Like, you know right. what I mean? <laughs> you right, can go right. and listen to some of it, come back to it later, finish it up. You know, it's, you break it out, break it up however you want it, folks. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. But again, Jack, you know, I, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, like I said, if one thing that's come out of this, it's, uh, the, the friendship that you and I have. And, uh, I'm just very grateful that music brought us together and, uh, continues to, you know, keep our friendship growing. Absolutely, man. I, uh, you know, there's no doubt about that. And I'm, uh, couldn't couldn't think of any anyone any other promoter I'd rather work with. No offense to the other ones out there, but uh, I'm glad to be part of the Blind Anxiety family. All right, very cool, Jack. Thank you so much, and uh, you know, say hello to the wife for us. I will. You say hi to yours. All right, we'll do. Thank you so much to James Cripps of Blind Anxiety Entertainment. Just uh, man, what a great interview. Just a great conversation I had, and uh, you know, it didn't really occur to me um, just how closely kind of my you know, career with Vertebraker and his career as a promoter in Melbourne, you know, about how, you know, how both of those sort of happened at the same time, or at least they both started at the same time. Just uh, just a really cool thing about how our careers have sort of paralleled each other in that way. And like I said, he's just, I mean, he's one of the best promoters out there you could ask for. Just a wonderful guy. And uh, he seems like he's doing, has a lot of really cool things in the works with Blind Anxiety Entertainment. Uh, you know, what it's going to end up being, we don't know, but I can tell you that Vertebraker is absolutely thrilled to be part of, uh, to be part of the Blind Anxiety Entertainment roster. And uh, so definitely check them out on Facebook if you can. I, I'll definitely be providing links to them uh, to where you can find them. Um, as far as if you're, if you're in a band or if you're trying to, um, to sort of get on the roster, I would say be patient because, you know, again, he's just trying this thing out. And I'm sure if, um, you know, if he sees something in your band or if he sees something in you, I mean, definitely make yourselves known to him, but I wouldn't necessarily like ask to be a part of, um, of the roster if you're not on there right away, because again, it's still growing and just be patient with him. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, if, if he sees that you guys are cool and hardworking and if he, if, I mean, whether he likes your sound or not, if he sees that you guys have something, then I'm sure he will contact you. So Definitely, uh, you know, definitely keep, um, definitely let that be in a source of encouragement to all you other bands out there who might be looking to make a name for yourself as well. And uh, and I know James will be at uh, at the next Vertebraker show on Saturday, October seventeenth, at the Boondocks in Melbourne. We will be there with uh, Seven Stone Riot, as he mentioned earlier in the podcast. Uh, Seven Stone Riot, Detached, Emerge, and Best Supporting Actor. We will be there, and the week after that. Uh, Vertebraker will be at the Haven in Winter Park, Florida, which was something, which was a place we had also mentioned earlier. Uh, we will be there um, for that date of the Autumn Encore Tour, uh, which will be headlined by Ghost in the Attic from Michigan and our very good friends Vilify. And joining us there in the show will be Mink Mob, Stonebone, Only You, Sweet Oblique, Fighting the Silence, and Flakeskate. So uh, definitely a lot of uh, a lot of music in one night, but it should be a really cool show. And uh, tickets are available online, and and I will provide a link for that in the description as well. So definitely thank you to uh, to James once again for providing something from the from the point of view of a promoter, and uh, and it's very cool to have someone on that side of the business sort of offer in their perspective. Um, you know, on the music business as well. So it's just a really exciting, uh, exciting thing to have James be a part of. All right, and, and as always, uh, remember that we do have the uh, we are part of the Alley Core 
uh, Central Florida local rock documentary. Um, I will have a link to that in the description as well. Um, make sure you check that out. I mean, it's a, definitely an exciting project, this documentary that we're going to be a part of. There's still a crowdfunding you know, campaign they have going on right now, still trying to raise some money for it. So definitely get involved. Lots of good benefits and perks into doing that. Um, so definitely check out Alley Core Productions uh, as well. And as always, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Jack X Connor. Like me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Jack Connor Music. Uh, as always, feel free to check out the band at vertebreaker.net. And uh, go purchase our EP on iTunes, Amazon MP3. Uh, you could probably stream us on Spotify and pretty much any other, um, any other digital download uh, platform that you can find. Uh, we are out there, so definitely check our stuff out. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, make sure you email me at jackconnorpodcast at gmail.com or tweet me with the hashtag Phoenix Report. If you're listening to this on YouTube or iTunes, make sure you subscribe, leave a comment if that's possible, and go back and listen to all the other episodes. Thank you guys for listening. This has been the Phoenix Report with Jack Connor on the twobadbrains.com.